Hello again, welcome back to our next lesson from Calvin. This is our sixth and the final one for book one. Kind of hard to believe we're through one of the four books already. A little disclaimer as we start this uh, very timely topic of God's providence. Uh, I'm recording this actually a couple of days before um, the 2020 election. So uh, the opinions expressed herein are not based on the outcome of that election, whatever it may be, or if they've even figured it out by the time you um, uh, see this. So we're going to let uh, God's word speak for itself and Calvin help us to organize it. And maybe I can um, help a bit as we... Uh, try to understand this very, very powerful um, uh, thing that we need to grasp in our day and not lose sight of. This is this is such a, an important topic, and uh, so I ask for God's grace to uh, do it some sense of justice anyway. And so let's begin with a word of prayer, Father. Uh, you are so far above us, and we struggle to grasp that. And as we wrestle with these ideas here that are so profound, uh, we confess that we don't take them to heart, and our fears and anxieties betray the fact that our faith isn't what it should be. So as we reflect on this, uh, give us grace, and wisdom, not only to understand, but to live in light of the beautiful truths of your providence. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so as we've been doing, let me start with a little review. Um, so um, this is, again, the end of the first book, which has been on the knowledge of God, the creator. What have we learned? Well, we've seen how what we know is distorted by the fall. Uh, we'll come back to that actually next time. Um, but God has given us the spectacles of scripture to see it truly. So even though there's this, as we've said, census divinitatis, this sense of something divine in creation, only with scripture do we really see it. Um, God is spiritual and he is over creation, so we're not to make idols. God is also revealed in scripture as a trinity. So something which is clearly not able to be communicated in nature and only do we know that through the word of God. And thus other religions don't have a trinity because they respond to the census divinitatis, but not to the truth of the scripture. Um, he created not only earthly beings, but as we saw last time, spiritual beings, um, the angels and the devils, and even man, uh, as we are body and soul, and therefore we are spiritual as well. Now, we are finishing out this whole section on knowing God as the creator, and our last um, step is to see how God stands in relation to his own creation. And the answer to that is not, and we're going to mention deism a couple of times, not the deistic type of an approach, but he provides for it moment by moment. So the term providence obviously comes, obviously comes out of the idea of providing. So we don't understand God as creator if we don't see his providence over creation. So to think that he just kind of made it and sat back isn't going to work. God is sustaining it day by day. All the forces of nature that we've come to understand are God's ongoing activities. Um, not like a toy that's been wound up and set free, but still ongoingly controlled by God. So just to get us thinking before we get started, and because this is an immensely practical section today, and it's something that speaks to my heart, uh, and I hope it does to yours, is how do we see God's role in controlling the world? We pray for you know, people to get well and, and you know, for 
people to be saved, but sometimes we struggle to see the bigger picture of God being in control over everything, such as politics and world affairs. So whatever becomes of the election, um, God's still in control. Uh, whatever it is, we don't know what he's up to necessarily. Is he having mercy on our country? Is he uh, uh, giving us the justice we deserve because as a nation we've strayed so far from him? Uh, whatever that is, and around the world, um, what's going on? What is the meaning of the coronavirus? Uh, how do we see God as behind that? And what about on a more personal level, my life and what happens to me? Am I afraid of losing a job or am I afraid of um, getting ill or something? How do I see God in relation to that? And then there are symptoms if one doesn't have a healthy doctrine of providence. And we're going to talk about these in a few minutes. But these symptoms are really symptoms of not having a big enough God. They're symptoms of things that we don't see God as big enough. We're going to see them as ang anger and as anxiety and avoidance. That is, we're too scared to do things that maybe we need to do for the kingdom of God. So ask God to show you some areas here and see if we can address them as we go along. So our plan is I'm going to take Calvin a little bit out of order, nothing dramatic here. Um, kind of presents the doctrine and goes through some of the implications of it and then deals with um, in the final chapter with some challenges to it. I'm going to do the challenges before the kind of applied section so that we end up with the application at the end of our time together. So nothing too dramatic and changing in Calvin. Okay, so God by his power rules creation through providence. So this is the you know, final big point. Now that we've seen all this about creation, God rules it through his providence. And so we're going to go through three steps. It's going to be asserted and defended. Then he's going to produce proofs. And then we'll look at the providence as opposed to the ideas of chance and luck. But I thought it might take just a moment to kind of put this in context of election, because so many people think, oh, Calvin, election, and so forth. He's not talking about election at this point. We'll get to that for sure. But you're well into um, the Institutes before you get to Calvin section on election. <clears throat> and here's why. Election is a subset of providence. If God is in control of everything, then he would be the one who is choosing who comes to know him, right? So that doesn't exist as this isolated doctrine. It is a subset of this. Nothing is outside his control. Nothing happens without his uh, involvement in that. So how in the world can we come to know Christ and surprise God if he's provident? So election fits neatly as a subset of providence. So if we get providence now, election will flow pretty naturally a little later on. If we don't like election, we're going to have trouble with providence because there are things over which he is not in control. So that's just a little preview. Uh, we won't linger there, but I thought we'd take a moment to kind of point that out. So let's talk about God's special providence being asserted and defended. Um, so God's providence is involved not just in creating the universe, but in sustaining it. Right, so we've already made this point, but let me let Calvin speak. We see the presence of divine power shining as much in the continuing state of the universe as in its inception. So he's not less involved. This goes against deism. If you remember deism, which some of the American founding fathers apparently sus subscribe to, is there's a belief in God, but God winds up the universe like a toy and sets it out of there and then watches it run. And is passive in, in uh, observer, just being an observer as it goes along. So I allude to what's called moralistic therapeutic deism here. This was a term that was um, coined by a, a re social uh, researcher named Christian Smith, who studied American youth. And what he found just a few years ago in studying them was 
um, he, a very thorough study of American youth and found out that more than we like to say, more than we tend to say, American young people are religious. But the type of religion, as he summarizes, it could be summarized as this, moralistic therapeutic deism. What does this mean? Deism in the sense God's not really involved in my life. Therapeutic in the sense, if he is, it's to make me feel good. He's kind of a divine therapist that kind of makes me feel good. And the moralistic is not like, you know, we need to do all that scripture says or anything like that, but just, you know, don't hurt anybody or anything. So very simplistic. This is what um, American young people believe. And so it isn't at all a God who is in control of all things. So we see here that God is more than just being the creator. He is the governor and the preserver. Uh, as Calvin says, he sustains, nourishes, and cares for everything he has made, even to the least sparrow. Or as the psalmist says, Lord, how manifold are your works, and wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. Here is the sea, great and wide, which teems with creatures innumerable, living things both small and great. There go the ships and Leviathan, which you formed to play in it. These all look to you to give them their food in due season. When you give it to them, they gather it up. And when you open your hand, they are filled with good things. When you hide your face, they are dismayed. When you take away their breath, they die and return to their dust. And when you send forth your spirit, they are created and you renew the face of the ground. Each creature is created as God sends forth his spirit. So in having this kind of a view of uh, providence, chance is out of the question. He says, well, you know, God even knows how many hairs are on our head, right? Which for many of us is fewer than it used to be. All events are governed by God's secret plan. And this, this now contrasts with a recent theological innovation, shall we say, called open theism. And this has been espoused actually in some of the more uh, traditionally conservative um, publishing houses in Christianity. And basically open theism says this, God knows all that can be known. So he is all knowing. But by definition, no one can know the future. Therefore, God doesn't know the future. But he's still all-knowing of everything that can be known. So that means God doesn't know what I'm going to have for lunch today. Right? Um, God doesn't know um, um, what I'm going to do tomorrow. Because that's just not knowable. And so the goal of this is to have God not responsible in any way when bad things happen. So if, if and this isn't consolation, if, if someone tragically dies in an accident, the comeback is, well, God didn't know that was going to happen. So don't blame God. But then what consolation is there in a God that isn't there at your neediest hour? So this has actually gotten some traction, which is kind of scary, but Calvin wouldn't have anything to do with open theism, and neither does the word of God. So this even explains why God created light prior to the sun. If you look at the order of creation, that, that God is the one who provides the light. The sun is um, what he tends to use, but he's not dependent on the sun for providing light. Right? And then even at that, he can control the sun, as we saw in, in Joshua 10, 13. Okay? So it's over everything. He does all that he pleases, according to Psalm 115. Therefore, Calvin says, in times of adversity, believers comfort themselves with the solace that they suffer nothing except by God's ordinance and command, for they are under his hand. Take a deep breath and let this sink in. In times of adversity, believers comfort themselves with the solace that they suffer nothing except by God's ordinance and command for they are under his hand. God gives us the suffering when we suffer. It is not something, oh, I'm sorry. It is here as his medicine in some sense. 
to help us because he cares most about our being conformed to his image and glorifying him and not about whether life's easy or not. And that's so American these days, right? To um, so Western, you know, that God's here to make us feel good or to make good things happen or to win the football game. So we get benefits on both sides. If we want to do good and we're scared to do it, there's plenty of power there. If he wants us to accomplish something, we can. But we also rest in his protections, protection. So again, Calvin speaks, we're superstitiously timid, I say. If whenever creatures threaten us or forcibly terrorize us, we become as fearful as if they had some intrinsic power to harm us or might wound us inadvertently and accidentally, or there was not enough help in God against their harmful acts. Listen to that, we are superstitiously timid. That is, it's superstitious because we don't believe in the God of the Bible when we fear man. And this is where in our difficult, troubled times that we live in, um, and again, it's fun to be saying this and I'm gonna hear what it sounds like <laughs> after the election, but if we get terrorized by what's going on, it merely tells us we don't have enough faith. That God is with us in this. God didn't ever promise a bed of roses. He promises he would never leave us or forsake us. And so there is plenty of help in God for the church to rise up. And as we know, in times of difficulty and persecution, it's been when the um, church rose up. Uh, Calvin would have known that, right? He got run out of his own country. And feared for his life. So what does providence look like? Nothing happens except what is knowingly and willingly decreed by him. So he decrees what happens. Uh, God is the keeper of the keys and the governor of all events. So it's an active thing. It's not like he's just sitting back and watching, you know, nudging something if it gets out of bounds. He is orchestrating the entire uh, symphony. He is the director of the entire play. So I love this little phrase. He rules with his hands no less than his eyes because he's actively doing it, not just watching it. God so attends to the regulation of individual events and not just the general big trends, but every little thing that they proceed from his set plan so that nothing takes place by chance. Hear that? Nothing takes place by chance. Plenty of proofs for this. I'm just going to go through these pretty quickly, but there are lots of these in scripture. Just regular events. He waters the earth with dew and rain, or he withholds the rain, or he sends harm to fields. So Calvin concludes it is certain that not one drop of rain falls without God's sure command. Now notice this language, that God allows the rain to come. No, God orders each drop of rain says, you fall. Now you, now you fall. So um, I was traveling the other day to take uh, uh, someone to uh, the uh, uh, Orange County Airport. And you know, even though Riverside got on, we went through a really nice um, little stretch of rain uh, on the way in. I was like, oh, man, why don't we get that at home? Uh, but God is orchestrating all of that. Particularly, he governs people. We see this in Proverbs. A man's steps are from the Lord. Uh, he was able to soften and harden Pharaoh, as we know. So it is an absurd folly that miserable men take it upon themselves to act without God. For they cannot even speak except as he wills. Do you understand the power of this? That the people who are shouting such blasphemy the terrorist who shouts Allah Akbar as um, they kill people, as we saw recently in, in, in France, um, they can't even speak without God willing it. We have a hard time grasping that. Um, no, we, we want to protect God from involvement in that, but we're going to see how this works a little more as we go along. 
So nothing at all in this world is undertaken without his determination. Psalm 75 adds, for not from the east nor from the west and not from the wilderness comes lifting up, but it is God who executes judgment, putting down one and lifting up another. So again, it's just not hard to prove this from scripture. For those who are not content with their own life, try to shake off the burden laid upon them by God. Let me pause here. This is one of my favorite quotes in this whole um, lesson today. When we are discontent with our lot, we are trying to shake off a burden that God has given us, and we are challenging his providence. Now, that doesn't mean if you're hungry, you don't try to get food. We're going to see that in a minute. What it does mean is God wants us to grow spiritually. God's less concerned with how big a house we have, uh, um, nor that we be, um, you know, fit and strong like an Arnold Schwarzenegger or something. All he wants, he wants us, he's very focused on his glory and our being um, renewed in the image of God. So let's realize that when we get discontent, when we gripe and complain, we are challenging God's providence. Because every little breeze, every life is from God. Now, Calvin isn't a fan of the word fate <laughs> because God is the ruler of all things. It's not just fate because it happened passively. Well, you couldn't help it. It was fate. Uh, in fact, he points out that fortune and chance are pagan terms uh, or the idea of a chance occurring. He says, is only that of which the reason and cause are secret. We call it chance simply because we don't understand the explanation of it. And we don't see how God, because God is not, obligated to explain what he's doing all the time. So like Augustine did, Calvin says, if anything is open, left open to chance and fortune, the world is out of control. And this is where it defies open theism. Because once God isn't in control, then we've got all kind of chaos. And our hope is really sh um, shaken. Now, the honest they may seem fortuitous, because we don't see God's uh, hidden purpose. For what seems to, for uh, what for us seems a contingency, faith recognizes to have been a secret impulse from God. So there in faith, we say, wow, wonder why he did that. We'll never know, but he's a good God. And he loves me. I didn't understand things my parents would do when I was a kid. And then I grow up and kind of say, oh, now I understand. It didn't make sense then, but it was for my good. Or that ever popular thing my parents would say when they would uh, um, spank me was, this hurts me more than it hurts you. And I was in my mind, I don't think so. And then I grow up and become a parent. And I see, oh yeah, I guess so. I see it now. There are just ways that we don't understand because we are so small. And God is so big that what he's doing for our good, we don't understand. And we're much better off if we just trust him in these things. God, by the bridle of his providence, turns every event in whatever way he wills. He is behind it all. So to wrap up this section, a really nice quote. Ignorance of providence is the ultimate of all miseries. In contrast, the highest blessedness lies in the knowledge of it. How much we suffer because we don't get this doctrine and how much more blessed we would be if we really, really grasped it. So for those who think theology isn't practical, chew on this. This is immensely practical. This has everything to do with how we see our lives. Well, now briefly, he presents two basic challenges to the doctrine. Again, this is in the third, the last chapter of the, the book, but I've kind of rearranged it so that we can land on more practical things. So first question, does God repent? Well, obviously those words are in scripture. Um, yet again, um, scripture says God is not a man and does not repent in 1 Samuel. And in the ESV, that's regret. So that's a little tricky. But what Calvin says is, so when God repents of having made Saul king, the change of mind is to be taken figuratively. 
God's language is accommodated to our capacity because we can't see the complexity of it. So he has to use the words that, you know, it's like talking to children. You can't explain difficult concepts. So you have to say it in simplistic ways. So this represents himself to us, not as he is in himself, but as he seems to us, because we can't see really what he's up to. We can't understand all of his plans. They're too complicated for us. So he kind of talks to us in baby talk, and that's where this language looks. Looks like he's changing his mind, but no, that's not really what's going on. It is God changing with respect to his actions, but in ways that are beyond what we can understand. And it looks like a change in his plan. Um, but it's actually his um, shaping it to his ultimate ends. Um, so second one is, is God responsible for evil? So if you can imagine evil on Sesame Street, I, here's your slide. Well, some trying to say, well, um, evil is different and God merely permits evil. He's not behind evil. Uh, he's not, you know, I mean, it's just like, like oh, here it, it comes along. No, because he, God is not going to let people away with saying God is in control of it. So buckle up for a couple of minutes, because this is a, a challenging part to understand as we try to understand God with our childish minds. So Calvin claims that God works in the ungodly and bends their minds to carry out his justice, even though he remains pure from every stain. He can work with our sinfulness to create it into good. This is basically Romans 8, 28. God causes all things to work together for good. So he can take evil and make it good. Um, and so he's using evil. So Calvin says, whatever men or Satan himself may instigate, God nevertheless holds the key. So he turns their efforts to carry out his judgments. So even in what man thinks is doing evil, uh, his own thing, God turns to accomplish his purposes. And this is, we see in Job. Um, uh, as Job points out, the Lord gave and, and takes away as it pleased him. So Job, Job saw God's hand in both getting stuff and in losing stuff. But the ultimate example, of course, is Jesus. You can almost imagine on that day that Satan was pretty excited. Uh, I've conspired now to create this thing that God can't stop. The Jews are there ready to destroy Christ. Pilate and his soldiers are cooperating with the plan. We're going to get Jesus killed. And yet when we look at Acts, nothing happened except what God had decreed. He orchestrated this whole scene that it looked like it was a victory for the devil. Calvin goes through other examples of where what seems to be evil is actually accomplishing good. Shimei, remember when he cursed David? Um, and you know, his associates were kind of saying, you want to take care of him for you, David? But the king said, what have I to do with you, you sons of Zariah? If he is cursing because the Lord has said to him, curse David, who then shall say, why have you done so? So he said, God had put it up to him. And so he would let him do it. Now, how does this work? Okay, this is a little thick. So stay with me for a couple of slides. Blindness and insanity are inflicted by God's just judgment. And so like in hardening hearts, Satan gets into entrance, but God controls that. This is you know, like Pharaoh's heart being hardened or soft. So a person is acted upon by God, yet in the same time act, himself acts. So if I'm robbing a bank, even as I'm doing it, God has given me the breath to do it. If I speak the words, stick them up, it is with the breath God gives me. Uh, so God is enabling it in a sense, but not my motive in so doing. Stay tuned. So God is the chief author of his own vengeance, while Satan is but the minister of it. So in a sinful world, God does these things to work um, justice. So I don't know. This is, a, you know, maybe true, maybe not true. But if we think about the letting loose of the coronavirus and how these little germs have 
upended the entire universe. I mean, the entire world, not universe, I guess. It hasn't spread that far. But how does that work? Is God not giving life to each one of these little virus, uh, um, uh, viruses? Is he not, could he not just kind of turn the switch and turn them off? And even if it has been done with mal bad motives, that it was, you know, covered up or wasn't handled right, he still uses it. And maybe that is to work humility to the world and its pride and its arrogance and to draw us to our knees to see how weak we are. We have nuclear weapons, but none of these protects us from this, these little viruses. So like we saw last week, as Luther had said, it's God's devil. So whatever the devil is up to, God is involved with working his purposes, even though the devil is doing evil. Thus, God is the chief author of his own vengeance, while Satan is but the minister of it. So, even though God's providence determines things, others bear responsibility for their sin, and God is not responsible. What he does is turn evil into good. And this is seen classically in Joseph's story, right? Where his brother sell him into slavery, and all these terrible things happen to, to Joseph, and at the end of the story, Joseph is in a position to save his family. Um, they bow down before him as he had seen in his dream way, way, way back when that must have been seemed like quite an alien <laughs> idea to him when he's in prison. And when he confronts his brothers, you intended it to me for evil, but God intended it to me for good. And if we had that attitude about everything in our lives, there would be much less bitterness among Christians. Because whatever evil is done to us, God turns for good. And if we can see that, then he is glorified. So how does this work? God uses um, bad wills to accomplish his righteous will, righteous will. So bear with me on this one, okay? This is <laughs> a little challenging. So God works in an amazing manner so that nothing is done without God's will, not even that which is against his will. <laughs> Got that? <laughs> Whew, okay. So Calvin uh, uses an illustration from St. Augustine. So let's imagine that a good son wants his father to live. I don't want my dad to be alive. I don't want my dad to die. But in God's providence, God wants this father to die. Well, then the son is at odds with God's will, but he is doing it out of the goodness and love for his father. So um, that is an evil, even though he goes contrary to God's will. But it can go the other way. What if a bad son wills his father to die, but God does too? Well, they, then that person shares in God's purpose, but the son is guilty because he wished ill against his father. Okay, so what we can will is a different thing than what God can will. We can will in our simple human ways. God has a will that transcends and understands all of his huge overriding purposes. So this is how God's will is not to be confused with his precept. God can use evil people breaking his precepts, you know, the law, so to speak, to accomplish his secret will, and they are still guilty. So, for example, when Absalom committed adultery with his father's wives, um, that was evil. But on the other hand, that served to punish David for his adultery. So God can work both of these together. Same thing as we saw just a minute ago with Joseph and his brothers. Okay? That, that they were guilty for what they did. But that was God's way of getting Joseph in the right place for the right time. Wow, if we could see this, it would make a difference in how we interact with other people. And we would be so different than the people around us. So to summarize all this with a quote from Augustine, and as you're kind of finding out, Calvin quotes Augustine a lot because, again, he was trying to demonstrate 
we're not making this stuff up. We draw this from the early church fathers. Well, it's consistent with it because we are reading scripture as they read it for the most part. Since the father delivered up the son and Christ, his body and Judas, his Lord, why in this delivering up is God just and man guilty? Unless because of the one thing they have done, the cause of their doing it is not one. So they do the same thing. The father delivers up the son and Judas uh, delivers up his Lord. But they're doing it one to the glory of God, one out of anger and hatred and jealousy. So it's motives that are key. Whoa, okay. Let's see if we can apply this a little bit here as we try to wrap up uh, here in the next few minutes. So how can we apply this? There are so many ways to apply this. So we need to understand it rightly. So this, yeah, this is a tough one. That's for sure to understand it. But God is provident over everything, past and future. For his people, even if bad things happen, what is he up to? He's either correcting us for something we've done or instructing us or um, correcting wicked affections or teaching us self-denial. That's one of Calvin's key virtues. Uh, or arousing us from sluggishness, right? Getting us from laziness. These things stir us up, sometimes getting us scared. How many people voted this year because they were scared? You know, they, they were roused up because of all that's going on. So God's secret plan has a broader justice than simply punishing each one as he deserves. Um, so that means that just because something bad happens doesn't mean it's punishment. There are lots of reasons. He might be doing that. Okay, so real important for us to understand that if we see somebody have something bad happen, it isn't a sign, well, God's punishing them. It's much more complex than that. And God doesn't have to explain what he's up to to us, right? He can do what he wants. Um, so uh, the key for us then is to submit to his plan, not to try to tell him how he can do it better. So for Calvin, submission is key. By being ready to follow God wherever he calls, we will show in very truth that nothing is more profitable than the knowledge of this doctrine. Because whatever befalls, there's a submission, there's an acceptance. You see Calvin when he's kicked out of Geneva, <laughs> um, coming back to this doctrine. Well, okay, I can work over here. Um, you know, he had to live it to see that whatever happens, we submit to what he has for us. Now, sometimes this has led to what is called hyper-Calvinism, which is we don't need to share the gospel because people are going to get saved anyway. We'll just lay back and let God work it out. He's not going to deprive them because they're elect. Of course, the answer to that, by the way, is uh, why do we share the gospel? Because God commanded us to. He's honored in our sharing it. Uh, can he get his word out without us? Yeah, he's not dependent upon us in that sense directly. However, it's our obedience that he's after. So we're to plan ahead, of course, but always in submission to his will, holding our plans loosely. If the Lord wills, we'll do this. Not, I have these plans, God bless them. But the best I can discern, this is my plan, and God use it to his glory. And we don't give up common sense things like, you know, well, I'm uh, have an infection, but I'm not going to take antibiotics because God can heal me without them. And it's kind of Christian scientist approach. No, God has given us means. That isn't the kind of thing. But we do submit that, well, he wanted me here. I'll do what I can to take care of myself. But I don't argue that why did I get sick or why would he do that? Other benefits, solace. You want peace in this crazy world? The heart will not doubt that God's singular providence keeps watch to preserve it and will not suffer anything to happen but what may turn out to its good and salvation. What a wonderful thing. Whatever happens, it's being worked together for good. This is back to Romans 8. Indeed, the principal purpose of biblical history 
is to teach us that the Lord watches over the ways of the saints with such great diligence so that they do not even stumble over a stone. He took care of things. Despite David's failure, he still became the ancestor of Jesus. Um, Abraham's end. One of the most beautiful things in scripture is that pretty much every character, not Jesus, of course, get some of their dirty laundry exposed, right? We see that they're all human and God still works with them. So um, not one hair is outside of God's control. And this means we're not to worry. How much do we worry? I certainly see that a lot in my office and people do struggle with this. Gratitude of mind for the favorable outcome of things, patience in adversity, and also incredible freedom from worry about the future all necessarily follow upon this knowledge. If he is working everything together for good, then um, it will be okay. Worry doubts this. Well, let's share a quick little story. And this is, we were a little short last week. This one may be a little long this week, if you'll bear with me. But as a kid, um, my mother and I my, were with my dad in a, in a strange city, um, not our hometown. Um, where dad had gone for a job interview. And he had to, uh, um, one night we had to go out uh, for some reason and we got lost and we were in this torrential downpour. It was, you know, so here we are in a strange city, lost, pouring rain at night. And the memory I have from that was sitting in the back seat of the car thinking, how cozy it is that we're in here safe and dry and all that rain is just inches away. And how in the world was I thinking that life was that cozy? I mean, we're lost, all these things are going on. And even though all these things were happening, the thing that worked for me was I knew who was driving. I had not one moment of doubt my dad would take care of us. So even in this difficult situation, I knew my dad would get us out and take care of us. And that is how we are to see God's providence because God is much more capable than my dad was. But my heavenly father will get us out of whatever we are in. This gives us strength in adversity. If anything adverse happens, straightway he will raise up his heart here up. Also unto God, whose hand can best impress patience and peaceful moderation of mind upon us. Peaceful moderation of mind. Even in the midst of chaos, the worst they can do is send us home to glory to God. You know, and if that sounds like a bad idea, we, we, something's wrong. What about anger and impatience? Well, when we are anger and impatient, we are not seeing God in things. In Psalm 39, 9, David keeps quiet because God has done it. I am mute. I do not open my mouth for it is you who have done it. Calvin says, if there is no more effective remedy for anger and impatience, he has surely benefited greatly who has so learned to meditate upon God's providence. Notice the meditating upon it. Listening to this isn't going to be enough. That he can always recall his mind to this point. The Lord has willed it. When somebody cuts you off in traffic, the Lord has willed it. Therefore, it must be born not only because one may not contend against it, but also because he wills nothing but what is just and expedient. If someone cuts you off in traffic, there's your chance to say, God bless him or her. So if we keep our eyes on God's providence, circumstances don't get to us. And there's happiness. Because the world doesn't have to treat us the way we deserve. It's seeing God's providence in all things. But what about anxiety? Uh, we are in danger all the time. If I can modernize Calvin's, he, he has a list. I just modernized this a little bit. We're in danger all the time. Every time we get out of the house, every time we're in a car or plane, even walking, we can slip and fall. Not to mention the, all the things we can do with coronavirus right now. Uh, dangers in walking include robbers and things like that. Here we you know, can easily uh, run into something on the streets around Southern California. Even if we stay in our yard, a snake could show up. Right? Um, 
we had to keep our dogs protected from a po our little dog from protected from a possum in our yard. Anything we eat could be bad or cause us to choke, which reminds me of a clever old Chinese proverb, a man cannot refuse to eat for fear of choking. Well, the point is we have to take some kind of risks. If we just get into this place, I've got to be safe at all the costs. We're paralyzed. But if we see God is in control, and again, this isn't like double dog daring God, but if we see God is in control, we can move into the world and take risks. People can go to the mission field where there are dangers and be trusting God in the process. So it's to follow God in obedience, not just to live a life of avoidance and staying away from things God might want us to do. Then joy. When that light of divine goodness has once shone upon a godly man, he is then relieved and set free, not only from the extreme anxiety and fear that were pressing him before, but from every care, for as he justly dreads fortune, so he fearlessly dares commit himself to God. Nothing can befall except he determined. Or to use the psalmist's words, where he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. One more time, we said this earlier, ignorance of providence is the ultimate of all miseries and the highest blessedness lies in the knowledge of it. So reflect on this. As I, Calvin suggests, meditate on it. What worries you? What are our anxieties? What do past events haunt us? What makes us angry? What do you not do because uh, that you think God would have you to do because you're afraid? And in considering those things, what kind of what does that say about our view of providence? How will you respond to what Calvin has drawn out of Scripture, and I've kind of tried to summarize, to contemplate so that you grow in understanding God's providence? So let me just uh, say a prayer as we wrap up here. God, there's so many ways we don't see your hand in things. We tremble like the people around us, and they don't see Jesus in us. In these days of heightened fear and uncertainties, may we as your people be testimonies to you because we trust in your providence. Give us the courage to do what you would have us to do and not avoid it because we're afraid you won't be there with us. Give us grace to uh, honor you by grasping your providence and living in light of it. Well, great. So finishes book one. And next week we'll begin book two where this beautiful creation gets messed up by sin. Didn't last long, did it? <laughs> it's the way that tends to go. So thank you so much for uh, Coming, sorry, it's a little longer this time, but this is such a rich section. I wanted to give it uh, um, as much time as we could and try to cover it all. So God bless you, and we'll talk to you next time.